Let God's word be proclaimed today with these words. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who were following shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Here ends the reading of the proclamation.
Friends, please join with me in our call to worship as printed in your bulletin, saying together, Awake to the day of triumph for our Savior. Give thanks for this day that leads to the cross. Come with your branches, hosannas, and psalms. Fill the air with welcome to the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us face this day of palms and Jesus' passion with honesty, confessing our sin before God. Together, let us pray. Holy God, sure of our faithfulness, even in your dying, comforted by your compassion toward your people in every age, we beg your mercy for our imperfect gratitude. We have looked to you for paltry favors when you have given everything. We have withheld from your people, our neighbors, and from your creation, our earth, the care and tending they deserve. We have rejected the cornerstone you sent to build the people of righteousness even here today. Forgive our failings. Heal what we have broken, nurture what we have neglected, and lead us to your vision, so that we may know peace of almost in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our God has come to us, humble in the form of a slave, to free us from the weight of sin and death. Jesus' obedient suffering has released us, our sins are forgiven in the name of the one who is exalted beyond what we can comprehend, Christ our Savior and Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. My friends, let us extend to each other the grace of peace, waving your palms or your palms. It is time for our announcements. Um, I will offer a couple of quick ones. Um, first, uh, know that this is the Sunday where we typically collect our offering of um, <laughs> one great hour. Thank you. Sometimes at my age, words just don't come out like they're supposed to. 
Anyway, should anyone have forgotten, please feel free to drop it in next week. That is certainly fine, too. Also, please note in the bulletin that we have two services during this week, so I call your attention both to Monday, Thursday, and to Good Friday. We look forward to all that we'll be able to attend. Do we have any other announcements to share? As you have probably seen in the Scoop and the Herald, there is a reminder about announcements and joys and concerns. We want everyone to be able to hear the prayers that we offer. So this is just a reminder to please hold the microphone like this, not down here like this. You see, you, you can't hear me if it's down here. These microphones have to be held straight out like this and close. So when the usher offers you a microphone, please be sure to hold it like this because we want to hear the prayers that we offer. Thank you. There will be food after worship today. Please come and join the celebration. We have a surprise visitor from Florida this morning. Our son Scott is joining us. Well, I, I know you're all dying to hear this news, but the Easter egg sale has made $800, which is more than we made last year. So, and we still have a few left for sale if anybody wants to get, on the, get in on that. And the other um, one is that the fun doesn't stop there because May 13th is our super sale. So get your stuff together and come and see Ellen or me and volunteer to help. We're looking for volunteers. Thanks. Let your word, O oh God, break open our hearts this day through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we may enter into the coming Holy Week with the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Amen. The second reading is from Philipp Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord.
I want to focus us this morning on the enormity as well as the gravity of all of the events of Holy Week. And if we're being honest with ourselves, sometimes, because unlike those who were there for that first Palm Sunday, who have no idea what is going to transpire, we do. And sometimes it feels to me as if I've flipped to the end of a particular book I'm reading to find out the result, especially if it's a mystery. This week, this holy week, every human emotion gets full treatment. And I want to start us off by focusing on what I call the kickoff parade, or parades, because there are actually two parades that went on that first Palm Sunday. And then a little later, I want to focus us on something that we don't focus on enough because we concentrate on the big stuff for Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, the Easter Vigil on Saturday, and of course, Resurrection Sunday. But allow me to set the scene again. The people who are watching this particular parade that we heard about in the reading from Mark have waited for what feels like an eternity for the promised Messiah. Their joy abounds until it doesn't. So let's give ourselves some permission to experience this carefully orchestrated parade, not at all haphazard, although it feels like it when you hear the gospel reading, but the details of this particular parade have been set down centuries before. The prophets foretold of the Messiah riding into Jerusalem on a young colt. And while today's parade with the colt, the palm branches, and the clothing spread out on the street may seem haphazard, it's not like the parades that we've watched during our lifetime with bands, floats, confetti, balloons. The prophet Zechariah foretold that the Messiah must ride into Jerusalem on the back of a colt. Must. Colt cloaks must be spread on the dusty Jerusalem street, much like the coronation depicted in 2 Kings, where Jehu is anointed by king, as, anointed as king by Elisha. Even the familiar words that we have said this morning, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, was written in Psalm 118. Thus this man, this Jesus, astride this colt, is the long-awaited Messiah, their true king, the one of whom the prophets spoke. But wait, don't powerful men ride into town astride a white stallion? Yes. On the opposite end of Jerusalem that day, the Roman governor, astride this magnificent white stallion, enters, followed by a full complement of the Roman legion, arriving to the cheers of a different crowd. For you see, the governor always came to Jerusalem for the Passover feast 
because Rome never takes chances with the provinces they control, no telling what might happen. So Rome always sends the governor to quash any possible disturbance and to remind the citizens to whom they owe their fealty. This Palm Sunday parade, or if I'm being more accurate, this procession, while it catches our attention, I feel sets up one of Jesus's most controversial acts, the cleansing of the temple. And I must be clear with you that it is not a capital T temple, but a lowercase t, and that's important. The problem wasn't with the temple, capital T itself, the holiest of holy places. The problem was with the stuff that surrounded it. We're not immune either from surrounding God's holy dwelling place with our stuff. What temples, small teas, do we have that need to be cleansed? The story about Jesus cleansing the temple has always fascinated me because it blows up any idea I ever had of Jesus as meek and mild. It's a myth. For Jesus undertakes one of the wildest, most politically disruptive acts of his entire ministry. Citizens of Jerusalem live with an uneasy existence, precariously perched between God and kings and overlords who keep coming and going. And the current overlords are the Romans. The Jewish people, the people of God, have always lived in the suspension of the now but the not yet. Many have come to Jerusalem claiming to be the Messiah. Jesus was not the first, nor has he been the last. So what is the big deal about another wannabe Messiah riding into Jerusalem perched precariously on the back of a colt? We have a Messiah running around today who would like to be in a Palm Sunday parade. Pastor Diana Butler Bass wrote about this pretender this week, actually, in her blog, The Cottage. Butler Bass says, a few days ago, a man staged what was a triumphal entry into an arena in Texas to kickstart his campaign to be a messiah. As the flag waving died down, he went on to predict his own arrest because he was tired of being predicted as a Satan. He wanted to call the people's attention to his true calling, that of messiahship. And this would be followed, he said, by betrayal at the hands of my political foes who want me to be brought to trial in front of a judge with punishment to follow. So the question for us today, tomorrow, the rest of this week, and the rest of our lives 
is who is our Messiah? Who is the one who rode into Jerusalem on that day so long ago? Who did what he had to do to cleanse the temple, to give us a template, if you will, on what we have to do in order for the Messiah, the Messiah, to come fully into our lives. For the Messiah arrived on that first Palm Sunday, but we still live in the not yet period. We're always of two mixed minds. We want the yoke of perceived injustices lifted from our backs. We really, really do want the Messiah to establish God's kingdom. Or do we? That's why I believe the cleansing of the temple is a key to understanding the importance of all the rest of the events that will transpire this week. That's why I suggest that we need to be continually cleansing the temple in order for God's reign to, be, to become reality. So I'd like to read to you that portion of scripture, which we rarely read during Holy Week, to remind us of this significant act that Jesus undertook on our behalf. The disciples, if you will remember, and Jesus left Jerusalem almost immediately after the Palm Sunday parade. They went to Bethany, and some things transpired there, important things. But then they came back to Jerusalem, and Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold the doves that would be sacrificed. He would not allow anyone to carry anything through the lowercase t temple because all these things took place outside of the holiest of holy place in the temple. He was teaching saying, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations but you, you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard what he was saying, they went looking for a way to have him killed, for they were afraid. They were afraid because the crowd was spellbound by his teaching. There are a number of biblical scholars who actually question whether this event ever happened. Because why would it? Wouldn't the temple police or the Roman soldiers arrest Jesus on the spot? I mean, he's creating a disturbance, maybe even a riot. But even if they didn't, or even if these folks in charge of law and order didn't come and arrest them. It doesn't mean that this story is not true. 
The cleansing of the temple is the symbolic act that tells us that the Messiah arrived on Palm Sunday. It is the coda, if you will, to the Palm Sunday parade. And that got me to thinking about what areas of distraction get in my way, and maybe yours, of believing that Jesus is indeed the Holy One of Israel. For in this cleansing of the temple, Jesus shows us what we need to do. The temple that Jesus wants is the temple that is built on our kindness our caring, our loving, the things we do to help each other, not denigrate one another. Somewhere deep inside us, we know that the kingdom is here, but not quite yet. We have more work to do to clear away what gets in the way, Injustice, greed, power, the list is long. And what do I mean when I say we have more work to do? Well, I am a, a disciple, if you will. I don't mean to use that in, in, in one sense. But I am, maybe it's better to say I'm a fan. I'm a fan of Father Richard Rohr. I read almost daily. Uh, what he writes, um, I think it's profound. And this is what he wrote last Sunday, and I'm going to read it to you just as it came out of his pen. We have to let go of our imperial ego. We need to allow, we need to give Jesus permission to transform us. Otherwise, We'll try to engineer our own transformation, and frankly, we're not good at it. We'll do it using our own rules and using our own power, which therefore, by definition, is not transformation. So this kickoff parade that we have, I have talked about this morning, this turning over the tables in the temple, is really all about letting go and letting God get about the business of transforming us into God's people. That's what I think Holy Week is really all about moving from the joy of a parade through all the events that take place that gets us to Easter Sunday, but more importantly, gets us past Easter Sunday and on to the business of transformation. Because in transformation, in transformation we are united with the one, the Holy One of Israel. Friends, I pray that I make it so. I pray that you make it so. May the joy of the work of this Holy Week be upon you. And may we look forward not only to resurrection, but to transformation into God's people. Amen and amen.
please join me in the invitation to offering. Lord, on this Sunday, as we lift our hazanas to the one who brings liberation, we offer our gifts and ourselves in gratitude and in the name of that same one who came to draw all people to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. need a time for us to share our joys and concerns. We have microphones available. A couple Sundays I wasn't here because early that morning my 13th granddaughter was born at my house. But it was a planned home birth, but she came a lot quicker than we thought. But she's fine. Lord, in your joyous mercy. joy and a concern to share. A joy, first of all, to see so many people here today. Um, I also want to share a concern for our friend Ralph Hadley. He has some more medical tests this week, and he'll be at the hospital, which a uh, place he knows and is familiar with, but he's going to stay overnight, so it's a little more concern. Um, and Ralph also uh, will soon have, be together with family to uh, memorialize their mother who passed away not too long ago. So we'll be meeting up in Lancaster next week. So prayers for Ralph and his family, please. Lord, in your mercy. I continue to hold my brother in my prayer as he grieves the passing of his wife. Lord, in your mercy. Your 
Let us pray. Our Savior comes to his humbling, he comes to his humbling riding a donkey and proclaiming a message of peace. Let us pray for the church, for earth and all its creatures, and for all people in need. That all ends of the earth receive the words of the King of Peace. That all leaders of church and the state prefer humble service to empty power. That all people live with gratitude for the gifts of nourishment, friendship, family, trust, patience, and hope. With the courage and wisdom to change whatever foils to be life giving. That we might live with gratitude for our ancestors whose faith and witness have nourished our own. That all who mourn today will be comforted. And that we who hope to greet Jesus when he comes again will be ready and filled with joy. God, our Creator, you show your sons and daughters the way to freedom through the gentle obedience of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, using the words we have been taught to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is 